on individual metals, first we want to talk about aluminum. This is a one-year chart. Similar to what we've shown in the past down below, I've got the relative strength index, uh, which is basically a gauge of whether things are oversold, overbought. You can see that in the last couple of weeks, we actually did get into pretty severe oversold conditions, which all things being equal can act as one of the indicators that might cause people to step in and start buying some contracts. And it looks like that's actually what's, what's happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, Something specifically, though, not just from a technical chart standpoint, happened as well, which was news started to proliferate from the London Metal Exchange, which is where a lot of these products are traded, that the LME is considering, and, and maybe they've been considering for a long time, but it was just put into the press that the LME is considering banning Russian material on the exchange. Now, why is that an issue? Russia is a very big player in aluminum. Russia is a very big player in nickel. And if the exchange bans that product on the exchange system, well, all of a sudden the available inventories on that exchange gets even leaner than what it already is, which admittedly in the case of aluminum and in the case of nickel, inventories on the exchange are actually already pretty lean. So you can see that that potentially coincided with when we saw this, uh, this rally actually take place in the last couple of days. I think the other thing that's taking place within the aluminum market is shown here. We've talked about this in prior couple of Joes, um, but this is ultimately looking at the cost curve or said a different way, the cost to smelt aluminum. Um, as, as many of you probably know, aluminum is extremely energy intensive. Um, so as natural gas prices, coal prices, um, electricity prices go higher and higher, it, it becomes more and more difficult for a smelter to make aluminum profitably. And the last time we hopped on, the, on this call, I, I put this blue dot where the prevailing price at the time was, which was actually further up in this area. We've got to shift it down and to the left because the price of aluminum now relative to a month ago or several months ago is getting cheaper. So what that means is fewer and fewer smelters are able to produce aluminum profitably in this environment. If we went back to the lows of a week or two ago, where prices actually got below a dollar per pound, you're talking about working your way all the way down in this area where you've probably got 60, 70% of aluminum smelters that were not making money for a period of time. What happens when you can't make aluminum as a smelter? You eventually shut in production. And, and we're seeing some headlines of European aluminum smelters doing exactly that. And I think more are probably at risk of doing that if in the event energy prices stay high and aluminum prices stay low. So this is a risk we certainly want to keep an eye on. Um, I personally, my, my personal opinion is that I think that probably limits how low we can ultimately go on the price of aluminum because the deeper and deeper we go, the more aluminum pr producers get unprofitable and then they shut in production and then all of a sudden supply and demand conditions balance out or, or ultimately get very tight and prices go back up. So I think we're seeing a little bit of that playing out. I'm not here to say we we already saw, saw the bottom or anything. I think we're, we're obviously going to see some turbulence here in the coming months. But, uh, but I think that that factor is certainly playing a role as we've seen prices start, start to stabilize. On the aluminum side for Midwest premiums, um, premiums, it seems like every single day we, we open up you know, our, our pricing sheets, Midwest premiums are, are headed lower. One of the big reasons for that is because the logistical networks of getting aluminum into the Midwestern part of the United States is getting easier. Uh, freight rates are coming down, at least for now. Um, demand for flatbed trucks and trucks in general is is loosening up. So, so th that's that's aiding the fact that premiums are heading in that same direction. Looking at the price of carbon sheet, not too much new to report here. There is one thing I do want to touch on, but ultimately the spreads between U.S. and European and Chinese steel they've converged back to more normalized ranges. I would say we're we're getting into a comfortable range. And the momentum to the downside certainly appears to be waning with U.S. prices. Now, that being said, the one caveat to all of that is scrap prices haven't yet really found a bottom. It seems like every single month we think they're going to stabilize. We think scrap prices on a month over month basis are going to be flat, maybe even slightly up. But we continue to, to come in each month and scrap prices are softening. And what that ultimately does is it makes electric arc furnaces ability to produce steel profitably, it, it just lowers that floor. So if we take, again, the, the math that we've historically done where we take scrap plus, plus $300, that floor perhaps is a little lower than 
than where the current futures market is. We use current futures are trading in the high 700s. Right now, if you take scrap, scrap plus 300, it's in the low 700s. Does that mean we're going to head to the low 700s? It doesn't have to, but that's kind of the fair value given where the cost of raw materials are ultimately. One thing that the mills are, are attempting to do to, to counteract that, however, is this is capacity utilization. So this is basically looking at the available productive capacity of US steel mills and looking at how many of them are actually producing at that rate. And you can see that production capacity is coming down, meaning mills are being taken offline or they aren't being restarted after, after getting some maintenance done to them. That is occurring. So some of the things we're seeing in aluminum where aluminum smelters are taking things offline because they're not profitable. Well, steel mills are, are doing a little bit of the same thing. And in the last week and a half, we got news that Mon Valley uh, is actually post maintenance deciding not to reopen for some indefinite period of time. Um, eventually, maybe, maybe they'll bring it back online, but that is aiding the fact that uh, capacity utilization is, is in the low 70s at this, at this stage. Or I apologize, high 70s, below 80%. And then a couple of months ago, we had Brian Crane in to talk about plate prices. And I think we were both kind of pounding the table saying the spread between hot roll coil and plate made no sense. I still contend that the spread is probably a bit exorbitant. And I, I think it's beginning to correct at this stage. So in the last month, I, I pulled up this chart from a month ago and uh, steel plate prices were about $130, $140 higher than where we are today. We got a price decrease announcement from a number, a number of the domestic plate mills. And I think that's really just an indication that even they know prices were too high relative to the rest of the carbon complex. So as I, as if, if I'm pulling out my crystal ball, I expect this spread, which currently is about 850, um, to continue to dwindle lower. And then lastly, on the stainless steel side of things, Stainless has had stainless and, and more specifically nickel has had an interesting 30 days where um, at the beginning of September, nickel prices experienced a pretty big rally. It was, I think it was about 25%, where it went from low nine dollars per pound all the way up to eleven fifty, kind of bumped into the 200 day moving average, which you can see shown here in the yellow line, and it, and it failed to break through it. So it failed to really gain real material momentum just yet. And, and since then, it's faded back down into the $10 per pound range. Um, it remains to be the case that this investigation into Russian material is, is going to be applicable to nickel as well. And you can bet that if Russian nickel is also banned from the exchange, that would further tighten what's already a fairly tight refined nickel market on the exchange. So I, I'm, I don't think the fundamentals barring you know, that situation really suggests we have a real big upside catalyst within nickel or, or more broadly stainless, but something like that could certainly cause a jolt within nickel prices if it were to take place. Um, looking at the technical side of things, the relative strength index down below, kind of in the, in the middle ground territory. So I wouldn't say from a price direction standpoint, there's really any compelling evidence that we need to break massively lower or higher at this stage. What did break uh, in, in one particular direction was the price of chrome. Um, chrome isn't something we're always talking about here on Cup of Joe or within Ryerson, but certainly on a quarter over quarter basis, we saw a fairly large reset where uh, chrome prices reset down by 31 cents per pound, which is almost 20% of, of where the price previously was. So expect that to feed through to lower surcharges as we roll into Q4 and the beginning of Q1. Um, a lot of that's really just on the back of supply chains beginning to loosen up, most specifically within South Africa, where uh, the bulk of, of chrome is produced. So anything related to flooding or COVID or the supply chain issues, um, they seem to be for the most part behind us. And with that, you can see chrome prices are getting back into a more normalized range relative to what we've seen in the past.